Welcome everyone. My name is Carol Allman Morton. I'm the Executive Director of Ollie at Berkshire Community College. We are so delighted to have you here tonight and to welcome back James Brooke. I'm going to make just a few announcements and then we'll get rolling. Um, as we go along, you can put your questions in the chat and our moderator, John Dixon, will get to as many as he can. And I encourage you to take a look at our listing of upcoming um, Ollie at BCC events on our website. I'm going to put that in the chat right now. Um, and I invite you to save what's not on there yet is I invite you to save the date for our um, fall 2023 open house for our classes for the in person classes that will be August 22nd at noon in person at BCC and for our zoom classes we will be sending that out electronically to anybody who might want to learn about those classes as well. And our fall semester begins September 18th, so I encourage you to come and check it out. And now I'm going to turn things over to John Dixon. Thank you, Carol. And uh, thank you for all you do for all of us who are members of OLLI uh, in, in Berkshire County. Um, pleased tonight to be able to introduce Jim Brooke uh, again. This is, I think, Jim, this is our fifth time of doing these updates on Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> a, a little background on Jim. He's a Berkshire native. He grew up in Lenox. He went to Yale and after uh, uh, learning foreign languages there, he decided that uh, he would like to become a journalist and with an urge to be a foreign correspondent. And for 24 years, he was a foreign correspondent with the New York Times. He was in Brazil, Canada, West Africa, Tokyo, Seoul, and the United States. And then <clears throat> after a short stint in Russia, he signed on as correspondent for the Voice of America there. Following that, he moved to Ukraine, and he lived there for six years, where he founded and edited newsletters on Ukraine's business and investment opportunities. Uh, in the past couple of years, he relocated back here shortly before the intervention, the invasion of Ukraine by uh, uh, Russia. He was living in Kyiv at the time and knows a lot of these places. Uh, Personally, he continues to serve as the editor of the Ukraine Financial News. He writes regular columns for the Berkshire Eagle on foreign affairs and also for the New York Sun. So Jim's uh, personal experiences in both Moscow and Kyiv, extended experiences, really make him uh, an ideal uh, interlocutor on an analyst of what's going on there now. I have found over, as many of you have, who've been to more than one of these, uh, found that he's amazingly informed, but also amazingly prescient about these next stages. So uh, we always look forward to look, having him look in his crystal ball and see what's next. But I think right now we last did this, I think uh, sometime, some months ago before this counteroffensive that he predicted would happen uh, this summer. Anyway, Jim, over to you. Great what we job. do is, let me just say, uh, He's going to talk for a little while if you have questions and put them in chat and I'll monitor that and then we'll open it up for discussion after, afterwards. Thanks. Good. Great, John. Thank you. And it, it's good to be back. Uh, these programs really are very useful for me to kind of distill my thinking and to bring myself up to date. Uh, and it's also very timely today because the New York Times announced or reported few hours ago that uh, Pentagon officials are saying the big offensive has started today in Ukraine, um, apparently involving thousands of Ukrainian soldiers, um, dozens of Bradley vehicles and uh, German Leopard tanks. So uh, this is very timely. And, and now we finally have the offensive. Um, I thought before we get into the nitty gritty of what's happening in the war, we would just step back and I'll give you 10 very digestible understandable takeaways of the significance of what we're living through, what we're witnessing this summer um, in the United States. Uh, a man I know, Bill Burns, who was US ambassador to Moscow, and now he runs a CIA, he used the word plastic. And we are indeed in a plastic era where everything is, many things are changing, at least in Europe. And so we have to watch how they're changing and, and where they're going. So let me give you 10 digestible points. Uh, one is maybe not hot news, but uh, today, southeastern Ukraine is the most heavily mined place in the world. 
uh, a area the size of Florida has now been contaminated by landmines and anti-personnel mines. And this is an issue that we will be dealing with for decades to come. I had the pleasure of just recently being in Cambodia. They've come through 30 years of demining and they still got 10 more years to go, largely foreign funded. Uh, thousands of Ukrainians have been maimed by mines. So Ukraine will become a big mine issue, demining issue well after Vladimir Putin. I'm talking to the 2060s or something. Um, and the thinking is that it, they may have um, spoiled, contaminated about 15% of the, the black earth. That's the famous ultra rich, uh, it's like gingerbread. It, it's what they grow the grain on. Um, so it has a real economic impact. Another issue is the kidnapped children. Uh, when I was in college, I went through Argentina in 1976 and it was a very hairy place. Came back as a reporter maybe 10 years later and there were these demonstrations of the, the grandmothers, the Plaza de Mayo, and they were looking for their kidnapped grandchildren. Uh, I bring this up because uh, this is why Putin has been brought up before the International Criminal Court on charges of kidnapping um, thousands of Ukrainian children. This issue will not go away. 50 years later in Argentina, they're doing DNA tests. People now middle age are realizing that their adoptive parents may actually have been complicit in killing their biological parents, uh, which is pretty horrible. Um, so that issue is not gonna be swept under the rug and that will be with us from Ukraine for decades to come. Another legacy of Vladimir Putin is there will be no short, medium term reconciliation between Ukrainians and Russians. Ukraine and Russia, the relationship was somewhat comparable to Canada and the US, uh, kissing cousins. And, and literally there were thousands if not millions of intermarriages. There was visa-free travel going back and forth. Many if not most Ukrainians uh, spoke Russian. Uh, that is now in the history books. Uh, those of you who've been to London, you've seen tabloid headlines that talk about the Jerry's. <laughs> well, the German Blitz was 80 years ago and they're still talking about it. So don't expect the Ukrainians to forget what's happened to them over the last 18 months. Um, we know the US embassy is taking tally of 95,000 war crimes. We just saw on Sunday, uh, the Russians bombed the Russian Orthodox Church in the cathedral in Odessa, which is a lovely structure. Um, there are just hundreds of cultural sites that have been destroyed and obviously thousands of people killed. Um, there was a poll taken uh, last month, 63% of Ukrainians, and there are about 35 million of them, 63% of Ukrainians said they had had a friend or family member killed or wounded in the war. So this has huge impact across society. Uh, they're not going to forget it and make nice when Putin goes. Uh, they'll probably want to have some sort of Berlin Wall keeping the Russians back. Too bad, but that's Putin's choice. Uh, and you see in terms of the level of patriotism, these news stories about amputees planning to go back into the war. Uh, these are men who've lost an arm or a leg and they're planning to go back, men and women. Okay. Um, Another digestible takeaway, NATO is energized and revived. There's obviously no question about that. Those of with a little gray hair, remember that word Finlandization. And that was Finland's study, studied effort at neutrality from essentially 1945 to this year, last March. Uh, Finland was neutral. They, they coddled the Soviets. They tried to get along with the Russians. Uh, that's all gone. Um, Finland joined NATO in March and will be followed uh, probably this fall by Sweden. Sweden. Sweden is jettisoning two centuries of neutrality, 200 years of neutrality, and Sweden is joining NATO. Uh, where does this leave us? Once again, for those with a little gray hair, we remember the Baltic Sea as kind of a Soviet sea. Well, it's now a NATO sea. All five Scandinavian countries are, will, are or will be um, NATO members. Just go around the clock. Uh, Sweden, Norway, uh, 
um, I'm going the wrong direction. Let's start Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland, which of course is outside of the, the Baltics. More importantly, the, all three Baltic nations are um, now in NATO, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. So the um, thanks to Vladimir Putin, the Baltic Sea is a NATO sea. Um, now this counters, I'm sure you all remember the Battle of Poltava, uh, but just to give you a hint, that was the Great Northern War in the early, say about 1705, when Peter the Great defeated the nasty Swedes and planted his flag on the Baltic Sea and formed, founded St. Petersburg. So we've had 320 years of Russian presence on the Baltic. And Putin has basically, to be rude, has pissed this away in 18 months. Uh, the Swedes and the Finns joined NATO, which is a voluntary club, because they were frightened, to be blunt. And they thought Ukraine today could be Finland next. Um, and a corollary of that, of the lesson of the war, is don't let them in. For several years, since the three Baltic nations joined NATO, the idea was, well, you know, we the Baltics with their little armies could hold off the Russians for a weekend and then NATO would come in. Now, and, and what we're seeing down in southeastern Ukraine is that it's very hard to dislodge uh, soldiers once they get entrenched. And it would probably mean the destruction of the Baltic countries as we know. I've been to all three. They're lovely little places. They do not want to be flattened in some war. So now the NATO doctrine is to forward position uh, men and materiel, men and women and materiel inside the Baltics to stop any Russian uh, invasion cold. Um, now, one, a lot of attention was given to the NATO summit uh, basically two weeks ago in Vilnius, Lithuania, one of the Baltic republics. Yes, NATO did not uh, give a timetable for um, Ukraine to join, but Ukraine has done us all a big favor. It has basically cut the Russian army in half operationally. The Russian army is not the threat it was in February of 2022. You know, the big red one, that's history. Um, just a few days ago, a senior Russian uh, threatened invasion of Poland. These are the kind of things that are coming out of Moscow these days. And really, you probably didn't read about the papers, like you on, you know, Russia's going to invade Poland. Yeah, tell us all about it. With what tanks? They've lost 3,000 tanks and, you know, 200,000 men killed and wounded. What are they going to invade Poland with? Uh, it's a symptom of Russian uh, aggression, but um, the simple fact is the Russian military threat has been cut in half. Um, okay. Russia is and will be isolated as long as Putin remains in power. Um, there's an entity that Americans don't really focus on called the BRICS, uh, Brush, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. It's a big deal to the leaders of those four five countries. And they love going to meetings in Brasilia or Shanghai or whatever. Well, Putin really wanted to go to South Africa for the BRICS meeting in two weeks in South Africa. Uh, and laid so much pressure that the South African South African leadership said that you know Russia could declare war on us. Well, Russia's busy declaring war on everybody. That's obviously not going to happen. But also, Putin doesn't dare travel to South Africa because South Africa is part of the international criminal signatory to international criminal court, and would have to uh, apprehend Putin. So there are very few places he can go. Uh, he's going to North Korea today. Um, well, a Russian delegation. He's actually going to China this fall. Um, he really can't travel to many places at all. And interestingly enough, they're having uh, tomorrow in St. Petersburg, this Russia-Africa summit. Well, the attendance will be half of what it was when the first one was held four years ago. Instead of 43, there'll be 21 leaders partly because of Western pressure, but also partly because of what is happening today in the Black Sea, where um, Russia is bombing grain ports, blowing up grain terminals, and basically running up the price of grain, which is a big issue for people in Africa. So it's very hard for the Africans to try to side with Russia on this one because they know full well who is blowing up Ukrainian grain terminals, and it's Russia. Um, 
Yeah, and going back to the isolation, um, another factoid I'm sure many people missed was that last week, Finland closed its consulate in St. Petersburg. Uh, I remember talking with the Finnish ambassador in Moscow, and he said that the busiest consulate in Europe was the Finnish consulate in St. Petersburg. They were cranking out half a million visas a year, basically so that Russians could drive across the border and go shopping. And some of them would continue on with their trips to Europe. Uh, that has been shut down. The US, British, French, German, and Dutch consulates in St. Petersburg have all closed. So St. Petersburg has reverted to becoming the Leningrad of 1923, very isolated. Um, so um, foreign investment, another factoid. I'm gonna take a little drink here. Um, as John may have mentioned, I was the Bloomberg bureau chief in Moscow. And basically the key part of that job is to clock uh, foreign companies investing in, in Russia. And, and Bloomberg is so laser focused on finance that they have a style rule that every news article has to have a dollar sign or a tradable company in the first two sentences. <laughs> so they are really into where the money's going. Well, the money's going out. Uh, we just learned that uh, Russia has stolen, seized, nationalized, um, Carlsberg Brewery, that's a billion dollar investment under the brand of Baltica, uh, Danon, the French yogurt company, and basically uh, Nissan, uh, Renault, Renault, Nissan. Um, these are big investments, big for Russia. When you look at Danon yogurt, I'm sure is maybe 2% of their revenues or something, but for Russia, it's a big deal. Now, some Russians may think, oh, well, you know, when Putin's gone next year to 10 years, They'll come back. I, I think, yes, people will come in in a post-Putin era and they'll look around and they'll go back to their headquarters and say, you know, it's great. They all speak German and English. The girls are beautiful. Everyone's smart. Um, it's a great consumer market of 130 million people, whatever. But there'll be these cranky 60-year-old men and women around the board table in Frankfurt saying, yeah, but they... Um, they stole our company way back in 2023. So there'll be institutional memory of these uh, seizures. Believe it or not, when I first went to Moscow, which was in 91, people were still talking about, uh, there was a group called the French Holders of Tsarist Railroad Bonds. <laughs> they, they hadn't papered their walls with these things, but maybe they put them in frames, but they really had the hope that they could cash these in for their face value, well, dream on. So investors, many investors don't forget. Some will, and the younger generation will be charging in boots first. And um, But I, I think people will stay away for a long time. Okay, here's another point of Putin's legacy. In the last year, Russia has lost the number one market for its number one export. Tick tock, tick tock, what am I talking about? I'm talking about sales of gas to Europe. Before the war, which was only in the middle of winter, January, 2022, Russia supplied half of Europe's gas needs. Through diversification, Russia, Europe now depends on Russia for 15, 1.5%. So it's gone from 50% to 15%. That's a huge loss. And most of that uh, gas, of course, moves by pipelines. So they've got these pipelines just sitting around, um, except for the one that blew up in the Baltic. Um, what's happened? The Germans, who are often uh, sort of underestimated, I think, uh, by this October, in about three months, the Germans will have six operating liquefied natural gas landing terminals where they had none this time last year. So in 18 months, they were going from zero to six for LNG landing terminals. The US through LNG, liquefied natural gas, now supplies more gas to Europe than Russia. Mm -hmm. Norway supplies more pipeline gas to Europe than Russia. These are real dollars and cents losses that the Russian people are gonna to have to shoulder for decades to come. 
now, undoubtedly, you know, Russia will cheap gas and people will go for it. But I'd be surprised if within 10 or 15 years, we see this 50% dependency on Russian gas. Also, Europe is taking this carbon free by 2020 very seriously. So they're, they're diversifying heavily into offshore wind, solar, et cetera. So they're, they're lowering their gas consumption anyhow. This means that um, European and Chinese companies are signing supply contracts with US companies through the 2040s. It's very rare I use that word 2040s, but we're talking about 20 year long-term supply contracts. That's taking the bread out of the mouth, mouth of the Russians. Um, very, very significant, um, but no need to be complacent. Uh, Putin will roll the dice again. And this winter, he expect him to play the energy card. Um, Europe kind of lucked out, they had a warm winter uh, and maybe this warm summer will carry through, but they had a warm winter and didn't need that much gas last winter. So they're helped by diversification of sources, a green energy and, um, and a warm winter. But Putin will do his best to run up ga natural gas prices and gasoline prices uh, because Putin clearly wants there to be inflation and high gasoline prices inside the US, um, hoping that would help um, Trump be elected. And we'll get into that a little later. Okay, another uh, digestible fact, China is coming out ahead. Uh, China is playing a very careful game. They are following sanctions up to a point. They don't wanna piss off the Europeans because it's a number one market or the Americans, their number one or two market. They are, um, they're sending non-lethal, they're exporting non-lethal lethal equipment like $100 million worth of drones, $200 million worth of these ceramic plates that you can use for body armor, but they're not selling their Soviet standard, they're not shipping their Soviet standard equipment as far as we know. Although uh, tomorrow, um, a Chinese and Russian delegation are, will converge on Pyongyang, and I'm sure uh, they will lean on Pyongyang to give as much um, Soviet standard equipment to Russia as possible. Um, so why does China benefit from this? China benefits from a weak Russia. What does China want from Russia? It doesn't really want the land, although it would like to have plantations, but it wants the oil, the gas, the water, the wood, the gold. Uh, and if China, if Russia is on its back foot, China can negotiate better deals. I, I've seen this when I lived in Tokyo. I saw this when I went to the Russian Far East. The Chinese are very cagey um, and they're cagey in March, two or three months ago when the Chinese premier Xi Jinping went to Moscow. And in advance, the prep was that he would agree to this power of Siberia to gas line that would funnel Russian gas to China. Well, he was there for three days and came and went and nothing happened. So they're holding out for the best deal possible. They already got a very good deal on the first one. So gas isn't fungible. You, you can't move it around that easily unless you have LNG. And Russia has one or two LNG plants. But since they've been... Um, basically nationalizing foreign oil companies. Foreign oil companies don't want to build LNG plants for them. And LNG is very complicated. So they're kind of stuck by selling their gas through pipelines. And as I said, just a few minutes ago, they've um, lost their number one market where all their pipelines essentially go with the exception of the one to China. All the pipelines go from East to West to Europe. So, uh, but China doesn't want a defeated Russia, uh, and it doesn't want to see Putin lose power. Um, There's a wonderful title to a book by a Nigerian novelist, uh, Things Fall Apart. And when the centrifugal force of Moscow loses its strength, you can envision that parts of Russia could fly off. Um, it's still far away, but um, we are seeing the sprouts of secessionist sentiment in areas that were heavily hit by this national draft. And one could envision 
there are calls for secessionism in Saha, which is economically independent. It does oil, gas, and diamonds, uh, gold, and, gold and diamonds. Um, the three Buddhist republics, Buratia, Kalmykia, and Tuva, the nine majority Muslim republics, these could spin off in some shape or form. Um, Russia is a federation of 82 uh, ethnic republics and, um, and units, essentially. Um, to, uh, a, de- a century ago, um, Lenin called the czarist Russia uh, Turma Narodov, which means a prison of peoples. Uh, and increasingly, some of these peoples on the periphery, especially after seeing their young men killed in Ukraine, are identifying with that point of view. So there could well be, the way there was in the early 90s, a lot of straining at the bonds that, of Moscow. If Moscow loses control, uh, I would not be surprised if some of the areas try to spin off on their own. Uh, so watch that space. And, and what I'm talking about would be the, the fourth kind of uh, the fourth collapse. If you go back to the 1980s, there's something called Comicon, which is a communist economic bloc, which included Cuba, Vietnam, and Mongolia, and of course the Soviet Union. Well, that fell apart. The Warsaw Pact fell apart, which were seven Eastern European, Central European nations. They're under the Soviet thumb. And then of course the Soviet Union fell apart. The third falling apart collapse. And um, of the 15 republics, there was Russia, uh, Soviet Union minus 14. uh, And that's part of Putin's problem. Um, We're seeing in the academic field, a slow view uh, evolution from Russian studies to Slavic studies of viewing, and this is still controversial, of viewing Russia as the last European empire that the Portuguese empire, which started in the 1500s, the French empire, the British empire, the German empire, the Dutch empire, the Italian empire, they've all gone by the wayside pretty much in the the 20th century. Um, Russia's surviving and its empire really dates back to Ivan the Terrible in the late 1600s uh, when they crossed the Urals. And, um, and some of these people haven't been very well digested and, and are restive. So, so watch that space, secessionism. Um, okay, let's get out of the sweep of history and stop talking about the 16th century and talk about uh, where we are this summer. Well, the big shocker was um, Prigozhin's uh, mutiny, uh, which caught everyone by, we, we sort of knew, we knew he was unhappy and we knew they were trying to take away his bread and butter, which was his, um, the money that he was getting from the central government. Uh, we did not expect him to um, launch a mutiny and try to drive to Moscow. Um, that day, you may recall that it was a Saturday and it started uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Putin was on the air denouncing Prigozhin and his comrades as traitors. Um, there was a firefight and these traitors did shoot down, I think it was six helicopters and one air command, a turboprop, a huge plane, killed about 20 Russian airmen and kept going um, until they got within about hundred miles south of the Kremlin walls and then inexplicably stopped, um, turned around and were left uh, allowed to go home unmolested. And it's very important to note they took over Rostov, Rostov na Danu, Rostov on the Don, which uh, for 10 years has been the Russian command center for Ukraine, because remember 10 years ago in 2014, Russia invaded part of Ukraine. So Rostov has been the Southern army command center for Russia for 10 years. They took it over without firing a shot. They left their bases inside Ukraine, drove in, took it over, and no one lifted a finger. They drove halfway up the country to uh, very close to to Moscow. Um, And then inexplicably, they turned around uh, and went back. Um, Even stranger, odder, five days later, the traitor 
and 35 of his top commanders were received in the Kremlin. And Putin likes to say that he gave them a good lecture. Uh, and then even odder, a day or two later, Pergozin was seen driving around St. Petersburg in a car, uh, collecting his um, gold guns and dollars that had been um, confiscated during the short-lived uprising. Now, what happened? Um, simple view, people say, well, there was compromat, but I don't think compromat is like basically, um, you know, revealing photos or information on Putin. But we all know Putin is probably the richest man in the world has gotten there by stealing money. So no one's gonna be shocked by that. Um, two weeks ago, Reuters came out with a fascinating report, which I urge everyone to look up. It's 3000 words. It's the work of 16 reporters. And the summary is that when this column was going north to, um, to Mo toward Moscow, at the city of Voronezh, it peeled over to the northeast and went in the direction of a uh, base called Voronezh Sorokpiat 45. Uh, Reuters is able to document the progression of this through talking to people who lived along the route and you know videos and this sort of thing. Um, Ukrainian military intelligence says, yes, they did get to Voronezh 45. Voronezh 45 is known for being a nuclear base that stores what are called suitcase bombs or backpack nukes. Uh, now, some people in Washington say, well, we signed a, an agreement back in you know, 1988 to get rid of these things. Well, maybe we did, maybe we didn't. Uh, the Prigozhin's group is almost entirely formed with military veterans who are ruthless, who know how things work. And Ukrainian military intelligence believes that Prigozhin may have picked up a couple of these loose nukes, backpack bombs. And then people say, well, he wouldn't know how to put them together. Well, you know, he has a lot of creepy people in his staff of 20,000, and they may well know how to put these things together. But uh, I personally think that is why Putin turned on a dime and handed him over to Lukashenko in Belarus and um, received him in the Kremlin, the traitor, and gave him back all his toys, his gun, gold, and dollars. And um, he's not getting any media time in the state controlled media in Russia, but he's alive for now. And I, I think that could have been what happened. Now, what else happened during that? Um, we know from a website called Flight Radar 24 that a presidential plane left uh, Moscow uh, around 2.30 in the afternoon. This is when the, the shooting was still going on in Voronezh, Voronezh City, not the base, um, and went up in the direction of Putin's hometown, St. Petersburg. Well, it's one of those things where, you know, Putin has maybe three or four planes, at a minimum. But Putin's people later confirmed that he went up to St. Petersburg because you may recall that date was the summer solstice, um, which is the longest day of the year. And St. Petersburg has this wonderful party called White Nights. I've been there. It's, it's amazing. It's funny. It's fun. You can walk around three o'clock without a flashlight. And there's a thing called Alia Parusa, which is this, the scarlet sails. And it's sort of a ghost boat that goes up the Neva. And Putin had uh, booked his presidential yacht and invited all his St. Petersburg buddies. And he wasn't really going to miss uh, the party for a coup. That's how you could read it from the outside. Now, 10 years ago, the Turkish president faced a coup and he survived it and he imprisoned 77,000 people. Uh, after all this came out, Turkish President Erdogan basically signaled that he thought that Putin has kind of lost his moho and, um, you know, slapping Prigozhin on the wrist. And so Erdogan approved Sweden joining NATO. Erdogan uh, signed a military drone deal with Ukraine. And um, Erdogan basically tilted towards NATO 
and the West, where he'd been kind of straddling the fence. So I think Putin really lost face with this uh, Prigozhin caper. Um, the final thing, and then we'll get into what's happening on the ground this summer. Um, in case you didn't hear, there's a great big sucking sound going on in Eastern Europe. And it's not the Ross Perot great big sucking sound. It's all the Soviet era war material left over from the Warsaw Pact that is going to help Ukraine defend itself. Um, the thinking in Poland is far better that Ukraine kill Russians in Eastern Ukraine than Poles have to kill Russians in Eastern Poland. Uh, I'll give you one example, Slovakia, remember Czechoslovakia, Slovakia is obviously a separate country, small, they gave all their MiGs and T-54 tanks to Ukraine, which is quite uh, symbolic. I think it illustrates the fear in Eastern Central Europe about the Russian threat. And two, there's a subset. What will they, Slovakia, by the way, is a NATO member. What will they replace them with? They will replace them with NATO standard. What is NATO standard? The US is 80% of NATO. So we will be selling them F-16s and um, you know, modern tanks, uh, Abrams tanks maybe. So all of Poland, Czech, Slovakia, uh, probably Romania have sent almost all their, their uh, Soviet era equipment, definitely the Baltics, uh, if they can get US standard replacement in time. So um, that is kind of a big plus for our arms industry. Uh, it's also um, strengthens NATO, the interoperability issue. And of course it, it helps Ukraine. And I think it, it illustrates that this is not, well, that the, the Europeans are frightened by what's happened in the last 18 months. Um, okay, let's get to the war. When you're on the offensive, generally you need to have a three to one advantage over the defending force. I'm talking about soldiers. Uh, Ukraine, simple in demographic terms, is outnumbered about four to one by Russia uh, and both have elderly populations. But um, the other challenge for Ukraine is that Russia essentially in the Southeastern area where I referred to at the outset as the most heavily mined corner of the planet, has had about a year to dig trenches, to lay minefields, to uh, dig anti-tank ditches, to lay what are called dragon's teeth, which are these uh, cement pyramids, which will hang up a, an APC armored personnel carrier. Um, the Russians have a trenching, it's not a tool, it's a machine. They can kind of trundle along. And frankly, the black earth is just like, as I said, like gingerbread. It can trundle along and, and maybe <clears throat> do a mile of trenches probably in a day. Um, and the front line is 600 miles, so do the math. Um, 600, uh, you know, they probably have maybe do three or four miles of trenches a day. But anyhow, they're, they're running into one of the most heavily fortified parts of the world. What is the goal? And maybe we'll show the map here. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, <clears throat> the goal is to go from the squibbit of Zaporizhia, the Z, and go down to Sea of Azov and cut, <clears throat> cut the land route from Russia proper into Crimea, which of course was annexed by Russia 10 years ago. Um, there are now, there's about a 60 mile gap they have to get through. And that is where the fighting started today in earnest. <clears throat> These towns that don't appear, but Tokmak and Melitopol. Um, by the way, all these towns that are in Pole, Catherine the Great thought it sounded kind of classy to put Pole at the end of a city because it was a Greek word. <laughs> so, Melitopol, Mariupol. Um, anyhow, uh, enough of that digression. Uh, so they're trying to get down into that area. The Russians have a problem, excuse me, the Ukrainians have a problem. They really don't have the air assets. Uh, the F-16s may show up next spring. Uh, they have to be trained how to use them. I mean, just to do a little bit of military history, <clears throat> 
before the Gulf War started on the ground, we bombed Iraq for um, 42 days. Um, when we, in the in Iraq and Kuwait, in 2003, when we invaded Iraq, there were literally a thousand airplanes involved. Um, so what the Ukrainians are trying to do is they're trying to get through without the kind of air support they need. And that's why not much has happened. They've recuperated 80 square miles in, in two months. Let's see what happens. The Russians actually have been quite uh, effective with these um, KA-52 alligator helicopters, which are their top of the line helicopters that can fire guided missiles from five miles away, which is twice the distance of the man pads, the, the shoulder held uh, missiles the uh, Ukrainians have. So these uh, K KA-52s have been quite, Kamov 52s have been quite effective. Um, and we also have not seen the collapse of the Russian lines yet due to morale. Uh, the Russians wised up and basically seized all the cell phones from the troops because their troops are using cell phones and the Russians would use that to pinpoint, the Ukrainians use that to pinpoint where the Russians were and then uh, bomb them. So the troops are in the trenches, probably without cell phones, probably may vaguely be aware that Prigozhin conducted a military uh, mutiny, vaguely aware that the former Ukrainian, the Russian commander in Ukraine is under house arrest. That's the charming guy called General Armageddon, vaguely aware that General Popov has also been put under house arrest. There's been a lot of unrest at the military high echelons because the war has gone so badly. How much of this news has filtered through, we don't know. Um, but uh, so the goal again is to drive down to the Azov and basically strangle supplies to Crimea. Um, they've done two things. They, they blew up the Kerch Bridge. You can see the Kerch straight down at the lower end of the bridge. That's a 12 mile bridge crossing the Kerch Strait from Crimea into um, the gray area, which is Russia proper. Uh, that was Putin's pet bridge. He had a sidekick build it. Uh, he personally inaugurated by driving a Russian made truck across it. Um, it was filmed and all over TV. Uh, he only inaugurated about three years ago. Well, first the Russian, and today, excuse me, yesterday, the uh, Russian intelligence, the SBU claimed credit, starting again, the Ukrainian intelligence agency claimed credit for bombing the bridge last October. Apparently it was a, a truck bomb that, that blew it up. Uh, it was semi-repaired. They blew it up again last week. Um, I think they use what's called a maritime drone, which is basically a, a, um, a motorboat without anyone driving it, but with tons of TNT inside. And they just um, piloted this motorboat underneath uh, one of the spans is 12 miles long, so there are many weak spots, and they blew it up. Um, they're also, with this drive, trying to, as I said, cut the land route from Mariupol into Crimea. Why is Crimea important? Well, what we've seen in the last week is that uh, Russia pulled out of the grain deal. It's um, about 80% of Ukraine's grain, and Ukraine is probably the top three grain producer in the world, depending by which measure, corn or wheat or barley. And it all goes through the Odessa region and those cities there, you see Kherson and Mikolaev. But the three Odessa ports are key. And everyone's heard of Odessa, but there are other ports you've never heard of called Chornomorsk, Yuzhny, and um, Pivdeni, actually it's called. Um, and that's where the grain goes. It, it goes, and it also goes down the river. Well, as we know, uh, the Russians blew the dam over the river, so river traffic is dead. Then, um, two days ago, they bombed two uh, ports on the Danube. I don't know if you can see that, John. That's down uh, on the borders of Romania, down there, exactly. They bombed Reni and Ismail. The Danube is often sort of a not very important export route. And the Danube, uh, because of the hot weather in Europe, 
um, the, the navigational levels are, of water are pretty low, but you know, maybe 10, 20% of the current crop could go through there, go upriver toward Germany. Um, these two ports were bombed uh, directly across the river from Romania. Romania is a NATO country. Romania has four NATO uh, bases or naval stations. Uh, Romania is obviously pretty annoyed about this, um, but uh, they're not getting too involved. Um, but the US and UK have warned that any civilian ship going in or out of the Odessa ports, um, the Russians may well attack it. And the US and UK have warned that the Russians are now sowing uh, sea mines, uh, they're mining the ports. Um, now these kind of mines, you know, you, you can pick them up and pull them out. It's a little bit easier maybe than landmines, but they can also sink a ship in the middle of the, the Black Sea. So basically um, the Black Sea port now to some degree, Danube ports. And, you know, you can say, sure, you know, ships can get through, but uh, try looking at their insurance bills. <laughs> you know, Lloyd of London is watching us very closely and insurance bills are going through the roof. Uh, the price of grain spiked 17% in the last few days due to this. And so it's unclear what Putin's gonna tell the African leaders tomorrow, um, but um, he's personally responsible for running up the price of grain. Um, so the Ukrainians believe they have to get Crimea, which is that you can see this Sevastopol and Simferopol, remember Pol, the German, excuse me, the Greek, suffix for city. This is Catherine Great's kind of empire dream. Uh, the Ukrainians want to take that back. Um, the Catherine the Great with Potemkin took that from the Turks around 18, 1780s. Uh, Moscow controlled it for maybe 140 years. Um, I can't do the math. If Khrushchev, for various reasons, gave it to Kyiv, but Kyiv was part of the Soviet Union, so it didn't really matter, but he gave it to Ukraine in 1954 after the death of Stalin, uh, partly because the water and the uh, electricity comes down from the mainland. Um, independent Ukraine controlled it for uh, from 1991 to 2014, and then um, uh, Russia annexed it. Ukrainians believe that for their own security, they have to uh, retake Crimea. And you see how Crimea sticks out into the Black Sea. It controls the Sea of Azov, which is supposed to be a binational sea, but now is controlled by Russia. Uh, but more importantly, it um, really puts all ships coming in and out of the Ukraine's Black Sea ports. It puts all of them in their, the gun sites of the Russian Navy. And so Ukraine says, we have to take this back. Um, which will be tough, but their, their approach is softening up. They blew up an ammunition dump in Crimea just a couple of days ago and trying to strangle the supplies um, from both sides. And that may force the Russian Navy potentially to evacuate and retreat to Novorossiysk or one of the Russian ports on the Black Sea. Um, now, um, I didn't talk about them blowing up the Novokhovka Dam, which now is clearly was the Russians did it. They controlled the dam for 18 months. Um, they said they had mined it. Uh, they threatened to blow it up before. Uh, Zelensky said they've mined it and uh, they blew it up. Uh, but that kind of ruthlessness is chilling because the Ukrainians understandably fear uh, for what is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, which is near uh, Zaporizhia. Um, it's called the Zaporizhia plant. And it has uh, six nuclear reactors. It's one of the 10 largest in the world, but it is the largest in Europe. Uh, five of the six reactors are have been turned off. Uh, one is sort of operating at half speed. Um, that little blue squiggle you see on the map has disappeared because uh, the Russians blew the dam and that reservoir drained out. 
Uh, the head of the IEA was there recently, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency was there recently and said there's enough water in the nuclear power plant cooling pond to cool um, the remaining reactor and, and keep the dormant reactors okay. Um, but on his tour, he did notice something odd, which he um, said in a statement Monday that he'd found uh, <clears throat> all around the large nuclear power plant in Europe are landmines. He said, having such explosives on the site is inconsistent with IEA safety standards, <laughs> which has got to be one of the understatements of the year. I don't know any nuclear power plant that is surrounded by landmines. Uh, <clears throat> so that's where we are. Um, I'll give you two little head thoughts, but watch the war, see how this offensive, I think we now have the real offensive underway now. Um, two things looking ahead to look at. Uh, one is uh, the possibility that uh, Donald Trump could return to the White House. Uh, if you look at the polls, that is a real possibility. Maybe half the polls say yes and half the polls say no. Um, Putin, is obviously going to hang on, hoping that happens, hoping that in January 2025, there's a change in the White House. Um, the day that Putin invaded, um, the day that Putin invaded Ukraine, Trump called the move a stroke of quote genius. Um, he has since said that on his first day back in the White House, he could solve the war in one day. Uh, in Ukraine, he's not seen as a friend of Ukraine. I was there when he basically pinched the garden hose uh, and held up congressionally approved military aid to Ukraine, uh, which was probably in I don't know, November, oh, excuse me, uh, September 2020, I think. Um, and he was trying, trying to get an investigation into Hunter Biden. Uh, so he has these delusions that the Ukrainians worked against him in the, I guess, 2016 campaign. And um, he, Putin sees him and the, the Kremlin, uh, you know, champagne corks were popping when he was elected the first time around. So they are basically hoping to hang in there to see if he can pull it off. What's the outcome? Uh, in case you forgot, quiz, factoid question, what is tomorrow? Tomorrow is the 70th, 70, 70th anniversary of the signing of the Korean War armistice. Um, we in the US, we tend to think that there's, you know, we won the Korean War because we're kind of dazzled by what South Korea has become. Uh, we didn't win it. We, we won the establishment of a stalemate. North Korea is still very much up there. North Korea is a rip-roaring success. But uh, it's all held together through this armistice. Uh, there's no peace treaty. Uh, there's no, you might call it a cessation of hostilities. Now that armistice, and Americans don't wanna hear this either, has been enforced by arming South Korea to the teeth, which is doable, and by um, stationing currently um, 28,500 US troops in South Korea. Now, they used to be between, many of them used to be between Seoul and the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. Um, they've been largely pulled back. I don't know if there are any still up there, but this is something that was called the human tripwire. In other words, if you, if North Korea goes nuts and tries to turn Seoul into a sea of fire, which they've declared they would do, if they kill several thousand US troops, the US would come down like a ton of bricks on North Korea. If they killed several thousand New Zealand troops, it wouldn't happen. So, sorry, um, if I think the same rationale would be that you arm Russia, arm Ukraine, that's what they call the, the porcupine strategy, where it's, it's totally undige undigestible by Russia and station uh, US troops uh, east of the Dnipro River, uh, with the same philosophy, same strategy, and that, that would keep the Russians at bay. Um, frankly, I, th I think if 
Russia suffers a decisive defeat, uh, Putin will lose power and Russia will be so wrapped up in his own eternal problems that it will not pose a threat to Ukraine in the next 10, 20 years. Um, so, you know, watch that space, see if Putin can survive the next year. Uh, but he's hanging in there. Um, so I think I'll wrap up with that. Um, I hope this is useful. It maybe isn't what everyone wanted to hear, but it's how I see it. And um, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, Jim, it's uh, more than useful. It's very uh, <clears throat> insightful and comprehensive and uh, deep uh, with a lot of information that I've never heard before, no matter what I've been reading. You've obviously been reading a lot. There's a fair number of things in chat, some of which are um, websites that maybe Ali can send out. Uh, some of the websites are about that um, dirt, the suitcase bomb uh, report that you were talking about, and we'll try to get that out to people. Um, I so, just I looked that up on Reuters again uh, just an hour ago, and it has not been amended. I mean, it's been out there for two two weeks, and it's um, still there. And and I think somebody put a foreign policy a magazine article up with the same on the same subject. But as I said, we'll try to get those to you. A, a quick question about there's a lot of questions and and a lot on different things that you talked about. Um, a quick thing, uh, let's do something easy first, nuclear power plants. How many other nuclear power plants does uh, does Ukraine have? Is it just the one? Uh, well, yeah, there's a power plant and then the nuclear reactors. So okay. um, what's in, um, it's in a town called Enerhodar, which means in Ukrainian gift of energy. And um, it has six reactors. Um, there are maybe four or five other functioning power plants around Ukraine. Um, there's one in Rivne. Um, they have not been hit. Um, as you know, the um, Russian soldiers did invade through the from the north out of Belarus into Chernobyl and occupied Chernobyl, which has been deactivated for many years. They did not damage the billion dollar containment shell over the sarcophagus of the um, of the power plant that uh, burned almost 40 years ago. Uh, but they were stupid enough to dig trenches in what's called the Red Forest. Uh, I guess they didn't see the um, Chernobyl series on TV. Uh, and so we know that many were hospitalized for radiation poisoning in Belarus. Um, so, um, you know, another advantage of having a free press is you know what's going on, but you dig trenches in the Red Forest. But anyhow, um, Ukraine and Russia are the, start again, Ukraine and France are the two countries in Europe that reply that rely on nuclear power for 50% of their electricity. That's historic. Um, and Ukraine had a lot of hydro, but the Russians just blew up one of their hydro plants at Novokhovka. Um, we've had a, a number of questions as well on um, NATO. And I'll start with a, a quick one, an easy one. You didn't, uh, should, should uh, the um, NATO meeting in the last couple of weeks, should they have invited Ukraine to become a member at that point? What do you think that they left it open, indeterminate, to be decided later? Not to be decided, but to be decided when later? Yeah. Well, short answer, yes. Uh, Ukrainians are doing the heavy lifting for Europe. They're the ones who are losing their legs and their lives and their houses and their churches uh, to hold back the Russians. Uh, so they're doing the work for NATO. Now, um, the problem with NATO is that it really is a US run operation. We're responsible, as I said, for about 80% of the budget. And if we have um, a change in Washington, uh, it, basically Donald Trump, if he comes back, he will not let Ukraine into NATO. Um, and so they, they wanted that kind of guarantee. They didn't want promises. They, they've had a lot of promises in the past. Um, but it didn't happen. That said, uh, we are shoveling um, vast amounts of military aid into Ukraine. I mean, Ukrainian army is increasingly totally NATO equipped. Uh, and Ukraine's army, uh, you could argue, this is, this is a joke, I think, in Moscow that, you know, um, when, we, when we started the war, 
Russia had the second most powerful army in the world. Now we have the second most powerful army in Ukraine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, so um, the uh, yeah, so they've uh, you know they, they've held back the Russians, and I think that's kind of where we are. I mean, uh, they, they're basically totally armed by NATO, uh, but manned by their own people, and and doing a heck of a job. So just a little bit more on on NATO. I mean, Putin said that uh, one of the reasons that he invaded Ukraine was this threat of, of NATO membership, and he didn't want that on his border, especially in, in a country that they viewed as uh, very close was Ukraine. And now it backfired because he thought he could divide NATO, and now it's even backfiring even more, as you mentioned, uh, with Finland and Sweden. But even more, I mean, NATO is moving closer and closer. You mentioned they have forces or putting forces into the Baltic states in order to not let them in. Isn't this, doesn't this just feed Putin's paranoia? It, it does, but that's Putin's paranoia. Um, NATO is not a, an aggressive force. They don't want to take over Russia. If you look at the number of NATO tanks in Europe, it went from, I think, 30,000 to 3,000, and half of the 3,000 were in workshops and more mothballs. Uh, there was the peace dividend. No one was intending to invade Russia, and frankly, NATO was not intending to let Ukraine in. A uh, quick thing on NATO. NATO is a club. You know, the Warsaw Pact was kind of a club at gunpoint, um, or club by clubbing. Um, NATO is a kind of club you try to get into and you know you floss your teeth and wear a nice coat and hope you'll be accepted. Uh, and, and countries aren't. I mean, Georgia wants to be in NATO. It won't be in NATO in the short term. Um, and um, I think uh, NATO has a rule that to join, you have to solve all your border conflicts. And believe it or not, there was a conflict between Hungary and Romania about the Hungarian F minority in Northern Romania. Um, and that had to be solved. The Hungary and Romania had to sign a border pact. Uh, and believe it or not, Greece and Turkey, you know, <laughs> not big friends, but they're, they're in NATO because they partly put their um, border conflicts aside. And that's why Russia stirs up all these border conflicts with Moldova, with Transnistria, the separate area, occupying two areas inside Georgia, uh, there have been talk about trying to foment separatist areas inside of the Baltics. Um, it, it's a very standard technique. And, and, you know, until Ukraine really goes back to its 19, 2014 borders, it will always have a border conflict. And I'm not saying that it will, but until that moment arrives, uh, that's a good excuse not to let uh, Ukraine in, inside NATO. Um, we also have a number of questions that are related to the anti-Ukraine voices in the United States, uh, whether they're, uh, somebody was mentioned, you know, RFK Jr. and uh, Scott Ritter and Scott McGregor, you mentioned a uh, former president. What, what is their view on this? I mean, is this a- well, I think it's, it's money down the rat hole, you know, they're very isolationist. Um, you know, what's fun is to look up on Wikipedia, America First. And as many of us know, there was a movement by 1938 to until Pearl Harbor. And there are a lot of very, uh, starting with Charles Lindbergh, but people like Lillian Gish, Hollywood movie actress. There are a lot of prominent, Kingman Brewster went on to run Yale. There are a lot of prominent, smart Americans who were very isolationist um, during that period. And, and they were traumatized, obviously, by the experience of World War One. Um, so, I mean, the American first was basically, you know, if Britain loses, tough luck, you know, that we, we don't need Britain, you know. Uh, it's really interesting to read that uh, Wikipedia entry on America first. And, and so surprise, surprise, we have American isolations once again, occupying, who knows, maybe five, 10%. They are influential inside the Republican Party, uh, but not dominant. I mean, you know, Pence, who was the former vice president, was in Kyiv earlier this month. Um, most of the, um, well, not DeSantis, but you know, many Republicans are uh, Mitch McConnell, who runs the Senate, 
Um, he was there. He's a very strong backer of, of Ukraine. So the Republican Party is divided on this issue. And it, it, you can't say that you know, all Republicans are isolationists. So one, on that, here's a, a maybe a big softball for you. But how important is it to the United States that Russia not prevail? Well, I think it's uh, important on many, many fronts. Um, it, it, well, the obvious one is Taiwan. It sends a green light to the uh, communist Chinese to try to take over Taiwan, which they said they want to do. Um, so you basically say, you know, surprise, surprise, we will stand up. And John, in my youth, I cover the Falklands War. And Maggie Thatcher said, screw it, and sent a whole battle fleet down to Argentina and whack the Argentines back into um, Buenos Aires. Um, you know, you can argue until you're blue in the face who should control the Malvinas, the Falklands, but the fact is that it was a violation of international law. Um, it's hugely important for the security of Europe. It's hugely important for NATO not to do this mass mobilization and lose a war. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a very important for Free societies, you know, the kind of liberal democracies that we all enjoy, whether it's Slovakia or Denmark or Iceland, uh, that um, authoritarian regimes be told you cannot invade a neighboring country, which is a multi-party democracy. I, I covered the election, you know, I covered the Zelensky's election. And frankly, he was considered sort of, after two years in power, we thought he was a loser. And we, you know, he really surprised us. But he was one of seven candidates and then he got into the runoff and he won the runoff and we had high hopes for him. Then he, our hopes were dashed. And then February 22 of last year rolled around and he, he rose the occasion. So um, I think it's very important for Europe and very important uh, for the cause of democracy and free markets. And not only did Zelensky rise to the uh, occasion, but the the marked difference between Zelensky saying, "I don't want a plane out of Ukraine; I want bullets," and Putin fleeing Moscow is really a quite dramatic uh, comparison. Um, we we have a number of questions about money, and you know, and and this is one question I have here. Russia is occupying the eastern parts of Ukraine. They're claiming it's their own, but they're laying waste to this part of the territory they, they claim is their own. They're, they're destroying the dams, they're destroying nuclear power plants. I mean, e even if they prevail, they're gonna prevail over Moon Rock, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, here's kind of the dirty secret about what's called the Donbass, which is that Don Basin area that um, I guess Stalin brought in a lot of convicts to work as uh, coal miners. So it's had a very rough history. Actually, Donetsk was founded by a Welsh man named Hughes who taught the, Rus the Russian empire how you can use coal and iron and make steel. <laughs> and it was called Hughesville uh, for a while. And obviously the Soviets didn't like that name. Uh, but uh, now it's kind of, I mean, 2014, the, that part was annexed. And you know, one third of the people went to Ukraine proper, one third stayed, and one third went to Russia. And when I was in Kyiv, they used to joke that the Donetsk People's Republic was actually the Donetsk Senior, Senior People's Republic. In other words, elderly people who could somehow get their pension stayed because they had an apartment or a cottage and a, a garden or something. Um, I mean, you hear about, people, one guy went to high school there and he said, my high school class had 200, now the same high school has like 20 or something. So. And it also, it was sort of a rust belt. It was like 1950s steel technology. Um, it was something that the EU calls green steel, which is partly a way to keep out <laughs> uh, Ukrainian steel. But, uh, you know, it, it's steel made with uh, maybe solar or wind energy. And there was a, a uh, oligarch, Akhmedov, was investing a billion dollars in Mariupol. That was the city that uh, Putin flattened uh, last fall. And he was investing a billion dollars to make green steel so that his steel could get into the EU. And he had solar uh, farms and uh, wind farms. Well, 
the stuff, you know, in the rest of the Donbass is sort of brown steel, you know, it, it won't never could be sold in Europe. Um, as I say, it, it's kind of an Appalachia rust belt area. Now Crimea, everyone loves Crimea. Crimea is the Florida of Ukraine. It's also the Florida, one of the Floridas of Russia. So the Russians love Crimea and the Ukrainians love Crimea. And, um, you know, how do they reconcile that? You know, some Salmonic decision, maybe demilitarize Crimea or something. Um, so, but I think the, and I'm talking for myself, I think you talk to people in Kiev, many would say, you know, we don't really want the Donbass back. Uh, not the part that was occupied after 2024. That was very productive um, after 2022. That was very productive farmland, but it's going to take a lot of demining to make it usable again. Um, so a little Monday morning quarterbacking. Do you think the, the West uh, writ large, United States and Europe, should have been providing uh, these weapons, ammunition from the start? They've kind of escalated slowly, but would it have been uh, better if we had just advanced those, uh, those munitions well before they're, they're arriving now? Yeah, I mean, that would have been nice, but you have to react a little bit to, you need a political consensus and, and a public opinion. And, and boy, the Germans turned on a dime after the war started, but it really wasn't there before. People thought the Biden administration, the Bill Burns and the head of the CIA were being alarmist. Um, and so, sure, it would have been great if more weapons had come earlier. I, you know, I think the war, people say, well, you know, the, the war started partly because the US and Europe never really stood up to Putin. In 2008, he invaded 20% of Georgia and people slapped him on the wrist. 2014, he invaded maybe 10% of Ukraine, 15% of Ukraine, um, slapped him on the wrist. I was in, just before I left Kyiv, um, uh, Kabul fell, Afghanistan fell. And, and really the, the pro-Kremlin, it's all Kremlin media, but people were commenting in Moscow, they're telling Ukrainians, you're next, your little American friendies are not gonna bail you out on this one. And so they were very confident that the US would not respond. Um, and here's another factoid. Do you know how many Ukrainians died defending Crimea in 2014? <clears throat> tick tock, tick tock. Two. <laughs> so uh, Putin, I mean, I think he suffers from very bad intelligence, but he could have believed this will be a cakewalk, you know, I'll run, kill Zelensky or send him off to Poland or somewhere. And, and uh, But what had happened, inside Ukraine, which went completely over the head of people in the Kremlin because they were just out of touch, was a huge sort of nation building, you know, spate of movies glorifying the anti-Soviet partisans of the 1950s. And, and, um, and that took place after uh, Russia had seized Crimea and uh, the Donbass. So looking ahead again, um... What about rebuilding Ukraine? Uh, who's responsible? What well, obviously, Russia's responsible. Um, but do we really want to have kind of Weimar Germany reparations? And the Russians are cranky enough without that. Um, we are lucky here in Lenox to have a Stuart Eisenstadt, um, who is the um, basically the lead American lawyer of the State Department on Holocaust reparations. And he's done a great job in getting money out of Germany for Holocaust survivors, not their children, grandchildren, but the actual people. So I, I asked him, I said, you know, well, what about, what about the $300 billion in Russian money, government money that is frozen in US, UK, EU and Swiss banks? Can we use that? And he said, oh, no, 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 that's really, that's, there's no legal precedent. Well, I think we need a new generation of Stuart Eisenstadt to uh, take on this issue. Um, this is Russian money uh, that they parked overseas because they didn't believe in their own country. And uh, it's government money. And, uh, you know, you broke it, you fix it, uh, you own it. Uh, so do, which is better to find a legal mechanism where we can use impounded Russian funds to the tune of $300 billion 
or we turn to American and European taxpayers and say, gee, you know, we're sorry that Putin destroyed this country. Do you mind uh, paying a thousand dollars ahead for the next 10 years to rebuild the place? Like people say, no, why should we do that? Why should the US and the EU be the lead in rebuilding Ukraine when we've got $300 billion salted away, frozen in Western banks, you know? I'm not saying that $300 billion will do the whole trick, but you know, maybe it'll pay for two thirds. And, and on that same thing, what do you, you mentioned uh, Putin possibly being arrested. If, if he goes to South Africa, they have to turn him over. Uh, what do you think of the uh, international uh, criminal charges, whether they're being brought in Ukraine or an international criminal court or a separate court? Russia's not, neither Ukraine nor Russia are members of the court, so it would have to be a, a separate body, but what do you- what Well, do you there's a lot of uh, really exciting work being done by uh, in forensic investigators and prosecutors uh, building cases while everything is fresh in everyone's minds, you know, before people forget and move away and this sort of thing. And, and actually getting the names of the uh, leaders of these Russian units that were killing people in places like Bucha, um, through cell phone records, this sort of thing. There's been some really good, uh, it's really reporting and detective work. And there will be a list of about a thousand Russians who will be indicted and they will, you know, we'll find in 2028, some Russian sergeant goes on vacation in, in you know, Antalya in Southern Turkey and he's collared. <laughs> Russia won't give them up, I don't think, but. Uh... <clears throat> so the, Keep at it like some of the other international courts. Have to yeah, take very, very important. Very important. It held them accountable. Um, a couple of other uh, specific questions. How about Ukraine has, um, Zelensky has removed some of his closest aides, whether they're cabinet ministers, charging them with corruption. What's your sense of, of corruption in Ukraine now? Yeah, well, it's bad. I think what's happening right now is that it's almost all shoulders to the wheel. I mean, there's a huge national mobilization behind the war effort. Now, once this $300 billion starts being dangled in front of their noses, there will be back to the same old games. And that's where there has to be an entity that makes aid contingent on firing all the judges. Almost all the judges are corrupt. Just you know, send them off somewhere and get new judges. And uh, they sexually did this in Georgia. He just fired all the police and, and you can do it. So fire all the judges, get 24 year old lower graduates, you know, and teach them how to do it right and, re and build a decent court system uh, and, and arrest people, arrest people uh, and jail them. Um, now, the, 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 there isn't a precedent for this, but we're going through unprecedented times. Uh, we're going through a nation building time. And, and frankly, Ukraine, I don't think is, was any more corrupt than Bulgaria or Romania. I mean, let's get real, um, but a, a lot can be done. It's an open society with a very vibrant uh, free press that needles people and that denounces and does good legwork and um, good stories. So. Uh, you know, unlike Russia, which is just a big kleptocracy where all the kickbacks go to Putin, or part of them do. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's on first. And there have been these Ukraine reconstruction conferences, and first on people's minds is rebuilding the court system or building a court system. Good, thank you. Uh, one, two, two last questions. One is about time. You mentioned that uh, Putin really wants to. Uh, uh, wait out till January 2025. Do you think he has that time? You know, Russia is a big place. And, you know, we think, oh, you know, he got really, he got dissed by this guy Prigozhin or this, you know, pop off, popped off. And, you know, well, there's a lot of inertia. And to quote our friend Vladimir Lenin, you know, nothing happens for decades and it happens in weeks. And, you know, I think if the regime collapses, it'll go with a big rush. Um, now, Putin's no dope. And by handing out, you know, beer breweries to his friends, 
and you know yogurt makers to other friends he's obviously and there's a lot of people i mean look at look at uh, maduro in, in venezuela a quarter of the population has left and, and he's still in power you know you can buy off people up to a certain point but um i think if he's really uh, cooked his goose on on losing the gas markets and yes he's selling the same amount of oil but he's selling it to India and China, which is like, whoa, just send that oil around the Cape of Good Hope or through Suez or somewhere. You know, shipping costs, insurance costs, and he's selling it at a discount. He's not making the easy money he was before, um, which financed Russia. Uh, I mean, a lot of Putin's success, if you look at the price of oil, just when he came in in 1991, <clears throat> proceeded to like triple. And when I lived there, which was 2006 to 2014, I mean, it was the golden era, you know. But anyhow, can Putin survive? That's a $64 question. I, 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 don't, I just don't know. And I, he's got body doubles. He's very hard to take out physically. The two or three little mini me's kind of running around. Uh, he's got four offices, which are identical. So when he talks to the people, you don't know if he's in Sochi or St. Petersburg or the Kremlin or his place outside of Moscow. Um, I used to watch his motorcade go by underneath my, um, I had a very nice penthouse apartment and, you know, they'd block all the traffic and go zooming by, but, you know, we didn't know if he was inside. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, all of this has been very, very helpful. Uh, and we learned a lot, I, I especially, uh, like your crystal ball um, view of a porcupine North Korea type of outcome here being probably uh, as realistic as anything uh, given that. But we have to wait, like you said, today, if today is the first day of this uh, big counteroffensive. Um, I did want to end with, uh, before thanking you, with a question from someone who said, uh, where would you recommend? We, you know, when this war started, there was a lot of people very interested in helping out, donating money to refugee groups and so forth as the Ukrainians were fleeing. Uh, and, and I'm as guilty as anybody is, that's kind of dried up. Personally, I haven't done it. Well, what would you recommend an individual do who's watching this from the comfort of our own homes as Ukraine, Ukrainians are genuinely suffering? Sure, John, I, I share that thought. And the NGO I like is run by an American friend of mine in Kyiv. It's called the Ukrainian, Ukrainian Freedom Foundation. Um, it's run by Andy Bain. And I knew his father when I lived in Denver. Andy's a Denverite, former U.S. Marine Corps colonel, uh, retired. Um, and he's been living in Ukraine for about 30 years. He, he actually runs a big ad agency. And he has very good connections with the military. So when you donate to the Ukrainian Freedom Foundation, um, the money, there's not much overhead. The money goes straight to the military in terms of bulletproof vests or, I don't know, field stoves or whatever. Uh, I, I don't think he deals with lethal equipment. And, um, but because he, he needs been to the front many times and he has, contacts with colonels, you know it'll go from Kyiv to the front line and not be diverted or, you know, price won't be doubled or something, whatever. Um, so I, I, Andy's a straight shooter and um, I've given to him and recommended that others do the same. Well, good, thank you very much. I had not heard of that organization. Um, well, this has been very informative, Jim, really uh, on behalf of everybody here and Ali, I uh, just I wanna thank you for this and for your insights uh, and your willingness to do this uh, for the community and appreciate it. And I know uh, I follow your uh, articles in the Eagle and in the Sun, the New York Sun, uh, and they're always good value. So thank you very much for doing this, Jim. Great, thank you, John. And thank you, Carol and Judith. And uh, I will sign off. And thank you everyone for coming out on a night, lovely summer afternoon, evening, and listening to this. Good. Next time, see you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.